All right. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. I am honored and delighted to have Bill Rowe here. Uh, he has a background in physics, he's a musician, and he's been studying Julian Jaynes. He, he just told me that he read the book as soon as it hit the book uh, the bookstores. So it's been a long time. Uh, and he, he's gonna be talking about the advent of uh, consciousness in children. So Bill, welcome. And so uh, let me just tell you the format folks, we're going to have a full presentation um, by Bill, about 45 minutes to about 60 minutes, and then we will do questions. So please, it's, it's actually very fundamental, uh, you know, fundamental kind of thinking. So as always, use this high technology to keep track of all the questions that you have, all the observations, all the agreements, disagreements, put them all together, and we will have plenty of time to discuss it. All right, so it's going to be interactive after the presentation. So Bill, go ahead, let's start the presentation. Well, no, let's try the green button. Oh, let's hit the green button. And Yes, I see it. It's there. Yes. Okay, let me get mine in place. Let me see if it's gonna move. Yeah, it will, okay. Are we ready? Yes. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. I can hear you perfectly. So, well, um, welcome everybody to Infancy, Rhythm, Affect, and the Advent of Consciousness. Um, the, this little, I, can, I assume it's a little girl there. I, I love this, whatever it is, <laughs> old painting uh, photograph. I've just always wondered, you know, what is she thinking or uh, what does she see in there? And, and Jane had a comment about this. So I'm, I'm the next slide. Um, if I can get there, uh, this, this is from the opening of his book. If there's anybody who hasn't read it, I suggest, you know, the opening paragraph is marvelous. Oh, what a world of unseen visions and heard silences, this insubstantial country of the mind. But the third paragraph, if you can see it there, uh, he said it was an intracosm that's more myself than anything I can find in a mirror. I read that pretty early on and it just totally captivated me. Well, what is that? Where did it come from and why? Um, so um, as it turns out, there's two origins of consciousness. There's one in antiquity and one in infancy and they're both required studying. But today we'll look at infancy. It has a lot to do though with uh, how it arose in ancient times. And maybe we can talk about that afterwards. Um, the first thing you learn from Jane's, which is a puzzle to everyone, is that it's not a genetic endowment. Uh, it must be learned, and you must learn it through other people. And this got my attention also, because uh, the first order of the day, if you're going to learn something, is time on task. And how do you get an infant to spend time on task with another moving, living person? So that's part of what uh, rhythm uh, is all about in this talk. The how to maintain attention on another human being so that you begin to learn things from them as an infant. Um, none of us probably have a memory of that transition from non-conscious to conscious, but you know we're lucky to have Helen Keller who did, and she has this stunning statement that before my teacher came to me, I did not know that I am. I guess that's first person singular, but it's, it's an unusual word to use, but I think it means that she just did not know that she was in existence the way we do anyway. Her illness didn't strike her till she was 18 months, which, which means she was a little bit along the way. And then she lost her hearing, she lost her vision, and then Anne Sullivan came to her. And so she was in a unique position to watch her own transition to consciousness. And The World I Live In is a good book to read to sort of get a sense for that. Um, so James is, this is his definition. Uh, it's an analog of what we call the real world. And it's built up of a vocabulary whose terms are all metaphors or analogs of behaviors in the physical world. We might wanna talk about what an analog is and what a metaphor is uh, later because people do scratch their heads over that. It's not a place in the brain. I worked in neuroscience for after physics for about 20 years. 
I never found a module for this. It's an, so it's, it's an activity, it's a process, and James called it an operator, like a mathematical operator, and his choice was multiplication. Um, three times five, three operates on five. So it's an operator and it produces this metaphorical cell. He said something else, which is these days um, really important, that it's intimately bound up with volition and decision. And today there are ways of studying volition and decision. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that later. It goes along, it, it's studied under the rubric of uh, predictive coding. And if you read those papers, they look highly mathematical, but they have everything to do with what it means to be making a decision moment by moment. And James was very concerned with that also. Um, so we become metaphorical beings uh, by the time the job is done. And this little guy here, uh, it was, it's from a book uh, that I did with Dominic Massaro at University of California, Santa Cruz. The little guy, I remember that I thought that in the future, I would know more. So those remembers and those thoughts and those know, those are abstractions. They're not physical things. They're treated like they're physical things when the job is done. And the future, James pointed out, uh, treated here as though it's a container that in the future, I would know more. That's a big part of James's theory is that we borrow from real space and we move abstractions like remember, thought, and know around in that space. And in, in, uh, for us, the past is behind us and the future is in front of us. But you know, to give you an idea of supporting James, how that's even arbitrary. There are cultures in which the past is in front of us and the future is back there. Because uh, we concentrate on action, on moving, and we move forward. Some cultures concentrate on what you can study, look at, and the past you can study and look at, therefore it's in front of us. The future you don't know about, therefore it's sneaking up from behind. Uh, these kind of things support James's theory of um, borrowing, using metaphors to create a brand new world, a uh, personal world. Uh, today, the, starting in the eight, 1980s, a new way of studying children came to be. And it's called theory of mind, and we're going to be looking at some of the details of it. But here I depicted the typical trajectory of a weird person. So weird, I don't know if everybody knows what weird is. Uh, Western educated individual, um, rich and democratic. Uh, most of the studies under theory of mind when it came to be as a discipline in the 80s was done in England, America, Canada, and Australia. So it was all done on weird people. There's a lot of corrections going on right now for that. But here it typically goes, the little infant there uh, lives in a blessed here and now state, doesn't know we're about to pull him out of it. The toddler is about to go mental. That's He's about to come to believe in himself as consisting of categories of thought, belief, desires, and memories. And then there's a seven-year-old. Uh, job is usually done by seven-year-old of being a lexicalized person, just like James says in his theory. Um, and one of the things that happens, this little guy is uh, about to go to confession because he now knows he's guilty of something because uh, he can narratize his life in this metaphorical space. Um, Whereas most animals, you know, they do something that goes against the group. They do shame, they feel shame. But when the stimulus is gone, they no longer feel the shame. But once you can narratize your life, you can just keep reminding yourself of what you did and that's guilt. And that's what Jane said that guilt is consciousized shame. Um, I, I like Jane's because I'd already prepared, I've been reading social scientists like George Herbert Mead, who talked like James does. There was a social self, there was a generalized other. Um, there was the individual, what it says there on the screen, the individual mind can exist only in a relation to other minds with shared meaning. People also said that you can only be a self through other people. And I always wanted to know what does through mean? It felt right, I knew, we, you know, came to be what we are through others. But what is this through? Um, 
And um, I didn't find it until the 70s when I discovered Daniel Stern. Uh, so this is a wonderful book called The Interpersonal World of the Infant. Uh, Daniel Stern was a psychologist and psychotherapist. We'll talk a little bit about him. But uh, two of the things that he was really interested in was rhythmic engagement and what's called affect attunement, which is kind of a kind of magic affect attunement. But uh, Stern was concerned with you know, the psychology of the adult as it emerged from a very intimate relationship with the caregivers. And the rhythmic entrenchment, affect engagement and affect attunement are part of that. And, and he and his colleagues, you know, struggled to find words like intersubjectivities to capture the unique intimacy that humans have with their caregivers once they have gone through these processes, which is what we're going to look at today. So the road to consciousness, initially the road to language, can be broken into four phases. It's actually a continuum. Uh, but the centroids of these things are identifiable enough that uh, they can be identified as I've labeled them. So to, to learn something from another person is different from learning to play the piano or something. The piano kind of stays still. But to learn from another person, there, all, there has to be something the two of you can share. Um, and, and that person is moving. You're always chasing them. It's like dancing. So um, the central column there under what is shared in uh, up to nine months, I have affect. So affect is like the outward expression of emotion. And the vehicle is rhythmic entrainment. We're gonna look at these closer. Um, there's nine months. Nine months is a big deal for a, a healthy developing infant. And I say there that subjective experience can be shared at that time. And the vehicle is affect attunement, which is a kind of imitation but one in which the overt gesture is not imitated. Instead, it's a subjective experience. And I'll show you why that can be done. And then as you move into the second year, a very important phase for Julian Jaynes, and that is pretense. Pretense is decoupling from reality and pretending the world is whatever you need it to be. It happens in the teen months for humans, the first uh, example of it. And it's not arbitrary what the child does. The, when the child first exhibits behavior of pretense, it's so, social scripts that the child is already engaged in with adults before that. And then the final stop is what uh, is shared is knowledge. And that's what we looked at under theory of mind. Uh, a seven-year-old now can talk to other people about these invisible things, what they're thinking about, what they remember, what they plan to do. Um, and so the behaviors are social interactions. So some examples of this though are going back to birth to nine months, face-to-face -face interaction, vocal turn-taking, kinesic turn-taking they call it, and that's whole body turn-taking. It basically looks like dancing, which it is the precursor to. And then uh, at nine months, uh, a healthy, typically developing infant in a nurturing environment begins doing behaviors that you cannot teach our nearest genetic relatives to do. And they say point, they give, they show things to adults, they tease adult, adults. There's a thing called social referencing and that is if a new object comes in the room, they look to the adult and whatever emotion the adult displays, they stamp that onto the new object. Uh, Chimpanzees don't get there even when they're raised in the homes or are trained in laboratories. Pretend play is just what it looks like. The, uh, the young child will pretend an object is something that it's not. The, the child will pretend that she is something she's not or she's somebody that she's not. This is, this is kind of amazing um, because maybe I don't know if I mentioned it. Most other creatures at that stage are trying to get the world right. And humans just veer 90 degrees off on that and just start making it up. That's kind of stunning. And then finally, what I've got here is examples of shared knowledge after, uh, after age seven. Uh, these are the names of tests, standardized tests that have come into being since roughly the early 80s. They can test children for, do they understand a person in terms of beliefs? 
And do they understand false belief? Do they know when an adult can be wrong? Uh, and there's appearance reality tests. If you take a cat and you put a dog's face mask on it, it's, it's still a cat. When does a child know that it is still a cat? Source of knowledge. If a child knows something, does it know how it acquired that knowledge? Did someone tell her? Did she reach in a bag and feel something? And then there's something which is incredible to talk about, deception, which James pointed out is not possible until you become um, conscious. And that we can talk about too, but that's not possible either until the child goes mental, so to speak, as I said in the earlier slide. So those, um, I claim that there, there are intimacies established here that no other living creature has access to. Um, and so we begin with rhythm. Um, these are still pictures here uh, that psychologists, mainly on the East Coast, um, were taking, were making movies because they could afford VCRs in the 70s. They were cheap enough. And you can see here, they didn't have split screen videos then, but um, the, the camera, because of that mirror, can see both the mother's face and the child's face and their bodies. So they can track the, the synchronization. And, you know, uh, well, next page. Um, here's what they began doing. So those still frames down there uh, were, they were recorded and they used a technique, those are called phase diagrams. Uh, I think they got that from a book called Rhythms of Dialogue, uh, Jaffe and Feldstein, two psychologists who videotaped adults talking to each other and mapped out how they synchronize all kinds of things. So, but these psychologists were quite shocked to find the order that there was to these synchronies. So if you can see it, there's partner A above is the infant, partner B below is the mother. T stands for a turn, within a turn, M stands for a, a movement, H is a hold, the arrows going up and down show their trade-offs when one is talking, when one are behaving and one is not. So uh, psych the scientists found an order here that mothers have known since there have been mothers, um, but it took video cameras and frame by frame analysis uh, for them to do that, and they could mathematize this. Basically, it is um, an aperiodic rhythm. And while that may sound strange, there is such a thing as aperiodic rhythms. And it's good that they are aperiodic. If the two were synchronized to a steady beat, the parties would habituate. They would quit noticing each other, and they couldn't learn from each other. But the way the synchrony happens here, it, it's like dancing each party kind of changes their mind just when the other party thinks it's gonna go one way. And that's one of the first times the child is beginning to learn that the world outside of her is a little different, but they stay engaged. They, they, they stay with it. And thus they learn uh, quite a bit. Um, the authors who were doing this were, they, they decided to pepper their papers with musical terms. I just wanted to show you this. Uh, Eddie Tronic, who will look at a video in a moment. Duet between maestro and pupil. Uh, William Condon, a beautiful rhythmic dance. Uh, Beatrice Beebe down below there. The kinesic rhythm, that's whole body rhythm of mother-infant interactions. So scientists discovered rhythm, which of course humans had actually known for a long time. So um, I'll start this and, and uh, Shrikant, we'll see if the, I think the sound will be there, but you, you can let me know and I'll activate Sounds sound good. if it's not. So this is called the still face experiment. Um, and what you will see is how tightly the infant has been accustomed to being bonded to the mother and how important it is to the child. Babies this you young it? are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying oh, 
30, 40 years ago when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. In this still phase experiment, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby about a year of age. I'm like a girl. Oh. And she gives a greeting to the baby. The baby gives a greeting back to her. Yeah. Yeah. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world, and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is used to. And then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. Yeah. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually may lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on, that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when you stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to so, get back. Thankfully, to that the infant good. got back to the good. I, I've watched this many times, and I just can't wait for when she finally says, I'm here. <laughs> and, wow. And they re-engage. But, wow. uh, but that gives you a sense, maybe of stuff we've seen over and over again, but that is a bonding that you just don't see anywhere in the animal kingdom other than between humans. And that child is on its way to learning from that mother uh, one very important thing we'll look at and that other people have a different view. Points of views are different. The adult form of this is dance. Uh, the, there are no known cultures that do not dance. Um, and uh, I, I've worked for numerous neuroscience companies doing for brain implants. And um, I, that gave me an opportunity to spend more time on the brain and uh, I could find no module for dancing. Um, it's, it's not a requirement. It, it's kind of stunning. Uh, both, uh, I mean, language is not genetic. It has to be taught. And there, it's one thing that everybody agrees on that makes us special. But dance too, uh, rhythm, um, it's learned quickly though. And all, all human cultures, the infant is extremely vulnerable at birth. It has to be held close and the infant picks up on rhythmic behavior right away and never loses it. It's very joyful. Again, it comes back to this thing I call predictive coding. If we ever wanna get back to that, the very quick rewards that come at the sub-second level of making a prediction, taking action and confirming it uh, is extremely pleasurable. And you can just dance and dance and dance without getting tired, <laughs> humans do. So the adult form of that is dance. So we move now to the, the nine month miracle. The infant has come up on nine months. Um, this is where these behaviors uh, emerge. The child begins to point, give things to the adult, begins to share things with the adult, begins to tease the adult. Um, and these other things I pointed out, they look, look to where the adult is looking. Uh, and if there's a strange object, they will take on the emotional tenor that the adult displays. Um, so uh, 
these show an early sensitivity to the psychological relations between people, not just the actions of other people. For instance, as I mentioned there, giving indicates a sensitivity to the adult's desire, social referencing to the adult's emotions. Pointing, they have a sensitivity to the adult's states of intention. They're beginning to understand the adult in terms of, this is a term of art in the field, intentionality, understanding the other person from the point of view of their intentionalities. Um, and then there's a form of imitation. Imitation is great. It's what we need. People do it. Um, but affect attunement is a special form of it. And it looks like imitation, but it's not. So affect attunement is a mimetic form of imitation in which what is referred to is not the action. It's an internal feeling state. And you might wonder, how can that be done? Um, so here's how it's done. Um, this is an example from Daniel. Uh, I thought I had Daniel Stern's book. But Daniel Stern, the psychotherapist I mentioned. Um, a 10 month old girl has just done something amusing. And so her face opens up, her face, her mouth opens wide, her eyes open wide, her eyebrows go up, her skin probably flushes. And there's an arc to it and she comes back down. And the intensity contour in that graph is the shape of what the infant did with her face. The mother did not do the same thing. If the mother had done that, the infant would have barely noticed and the two of them would have moved on. What the mother did is, as it says over there on the right, she abstracted the intensity contours of what that child did and played it back in another modality. That's quite a skill. I've never heard of an animal, any animals doing that. You abstract the, the way a, a thing was done and you play that back in a different modality. So what the child pro witnesses here is his or her past experience. It should have a kind of deja vu experience when you first, ha it happens to you because you're seeing somebody do something you did not do. And yet in that action, it, there is well, how I just felt those intensity contours. Um, and uh, if the mother had just duplicated what I've said, the, the infant probably would not have noticed. Other, other ways of doing it, a, a, a child may pick up uh, a toy something and go, and the mother will not pick up something and do that. The mother will go, oh, 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 oh. Once again, the child sees something completely different. But in that is an unnameable familiarity. Um, and I don't think any culture take, goes to the, oh, well, there's the last thing on this. So true imitation doesn't allow the people to refer to internal feeling states. It concentrates on the overt action. And that's great, it's good as it is, but it maintains the focus on that. So Daniel Stern way of saying this is imitation renders form, but attunement renders feeling. We all do this. Everybody does it around the world. Again, thankfully, no culture tries to name it. It would take the magic out of being together. Um, so these variations, it, it shows that uh, it, personal experience is in fact shareable. And in fact, you and I are actually permeable. The, our core self can be breached all of a sudden by somebody doing this. Um, and Daniel Stern takes it so seriously in his book, The Interpersonal World of the Infant. He was a psychotherapist that, that he put a lot of time into what happens to an adult who has experienced various versions of these attunements. A mother will often use attunements to do something very helpful. If the kid is crying or upset, she will do a quick attunement to sort of, in air quotes here, get inside. And then once she has the infant's attention, direct it away. But we can do this all the time. So there can be misattunements, as I have there. Um, people are not would not are not good at it. There can be underattunements. There can be overattunements. It can be an oppressive caregiver, or there can be inauthentic ones. You can probably lie with attunements. But 
if, if you see what attunements are, they're kind of very strange ways of sending messages. Um, I, the first time I heard, I thought of this when I heard the sort of a famous joke among psychologists that two people pass each other in the hallway and they say hi. And then as they each go away, they both wonder, what do you mean by that? And so you think, whoa, how could somebody wonder? They, they said hi, should be good. But it, not only is it how you said hi, did you go, hi, or hi, or did you wait a while and go, hi. But there's another thing you can do. If, if you're approaching that person and you can sense their mood, you could say hi in a way that reflects through affect attunement, their mood, and they would feel it. So these are, it's affect attunement is a, a kind of a strange thing, uh, almost magical that we can actually refer to each other's internal feeling states without doing it overtly. Um, but this, I claim, the infant does be, the, begin to sense from the caregivers. And like I say, you can use it to direct an, an infant's attention if they're crying or something by doing an attunement, getting their attention, and then taking them off in another direction. Um, so one thing I want to point out here and summing up this part of it. Um, when people talk about this from a theoretical point of view, they use the word simulation, that we simulate the world and we simulate the self. And then that is accurate from a predictive coding point of view. And from a neurological point of view, the, the reason we have a brain and plants don't is that we move. And well, as wonderful as that is, we can kill ourselves with the next move. You have to have a way to verify that what you're about to do is going to work. And so the brain is, is an organ of perception, first and foremost. For a moving creature, its first job is to keep you alive for the next quarter second. And if it does that, it's to do it again. And you, you, you know, other part, and parts of the brain can be re recruited to learn language and other things but you still have to stay alive uh, quarter second by quarter second. And so you, you really do have to be in a predictive state all the time. There's not a single move any of us can do right now that we can't be surprised if something interrupted it. If I'm gonna reach for the coffee, but my arm hits the side, I'm surprised. I couldn't have been surprised if that I did not have expectations of how my arm should feel for the whole extension. So those are proprioceptors feeding back. They're always working. They're always informing us um, whether we're doing what the brain had just planned for us to do. And then of course you have final contact with the world. Your brain has formed an expectation of what that feels like. If my hand reached, hit the mouse instead of the cup, I would be surprised. So the child is doing this too. And it's part of the way in which the child internalizes the other person being learns to be, it does what it does. It forms a predictive state about what it's like to be with that other person. For the first nine months though, they interact with adult as adult, as if they were just another part of the environment. They interact with the third object as though it were just a part of the world. They don't coordinate that. But by nine months through all the vehicles that we've just talked about, the, the, if you can see that the dashed arrows are, this is now a third object. The adult, the adult is now concentrating on a third object and the infant is at the same time. They're using all the uh, tools that we've just been talking about to, to understand the third object in the same way. And in the literature it's called joint attention or shared focal attention. And it's what enables us to engage in sustained attention on third objects and solve problems together um, and collaboratively deal with other issues together. But initially for this young infant, all the attunements and the rhythmic engagement of that other adult is now part of that child's predictive coding. The child knows how to reach for something, but it also has experienced how the adult reaches for something. And it has had various experiences along those lines. So the child actually has coded inside of it the way the adult would reach. And, but they're working on this third object together. 
So the child really does understand the third object. This is where the word through I used to, I was looking for. We learned to be a self through other people, but psychologists in the early 20th century to mid 20th century had no way of saying what through meant. This is definitely through. The infant is seeing the third object through the other person. And then this happens. The one day the adult looks at the third object, but the third object is the infant herself. And so those looping arrows there are meant to indicate that all the child has learned in that the other one were on the third object seen through the adult. Uh, the infant now is experiencing because the adult is focusing on me. And so I've changed the image there. The infant now for the first time is both the perceiver and the perceived. And this is pretty magical. Uh, it should be the first time that uh, the infant begins to sense herself or his self through another person. So that person is not a physical mirror like shown there that I used to wonder about. The person is a virtual mirror, but it still allows the infant to have a sense that the world is different from another person's point of view. So it's not quite a Helen Keller moment. Uh, before my teacher came to me, I did not know that I am, but it's a precursor to it and it soon will be that moment. Um, so that's the end of that section. Uh, that at nine months leads into pretense. Very, very likely, I, I haven't seen studies for it, the pretense, what characterizes it is the ability to hold multiple representations of the world at the same time. M most animals are trying to just get that one representation right. Whereas humans are holding, uh, you know, different, you know, you can hear it in crib talk um, and you can see it as the child plays, you know, tea like the little girl here. Uh, it may owe this ability to affect attunement where there the child experiences two representations at the same time, the physical movements that they're doing together and the referring to the invisible internal states. Uh, so that's anyway, I guess the pretense might owe the ability to hold multiple representation to affect attunement, whether it does or not, it's a unique phase the child passes through um, and they're not willy nilly. Again, all the examples in the teen months are of experiences the child has had with other people. And this is important for Julian James because the world we live in as conscious pe people is a pretend world. I, you know, I grew up thinking I was Irish. You know, my mother, your mother tells you you're Irish, you're Irish. I'd never been out of Jeffersonville, Indiana. Uh, but, you know, so there's a pretend world, you know, I, I knew how to act Irish and all that stuff. Um, but um, I have been to Ireland since. I finally did it two years ago. I recommend Ireland to everybody. So many shades of green. Uh, um, so, uh, but anyway, to, the ability to pretend uh, is, is crucial to Jane's. And so all autistic children probably know have trouble. They don't pass through this pretense stage. The world is concrete, uh, which means they probably missed that first year and all that other stuff of... Uh, that really yields everything I've been talking about, uh, a burgeoning sense that other people see the world differently, that there are other points of view, which could be considered the essence of being human, that we know the world isn't just about us, that other people have different points of view. Personally, I do think that what we've just been talking about ushers that in. Um, and... So the last stage is theory of mind. Uh, by between age five and seven, a child is pretty competent at thinking of his or herself in terms of these abstractions, beliefs, desires, thoughts, mental states. Um, the, this is sort of a quote I took behave, from a journal, Behavioral and Brain Scientists, Sciences. Between the ages of three and five, typically developing children begin to interpret the behavior of other people in terms of unobservable entities that behave in lawful ways. 
This is from uh, Alison Gopnik, who studies theory of mind at Berkeley. She's not interested in Julian Jeans, but what is said there supports Julian Jeans totally the, from the fact that it is a theory and that the entities of the theory behave in lawful ways. So the reason it's a theory is the slide I'm showing here is that these these abstractions that we conceive other people as having, um, you know, they're not physical, they're beliefs and desires. For instance, Sally is crying because she believed she would get an ice cream, but didn't. So that I conceptualize Sally in terms of, uh, of that uh, belief and it explains her behavior. And that's just like physicists, uh, center of mass is not a thing. It's, a, it's an abstraction, but uh, I don't know if you can see it, but it accounts for how a thing will wobble. And so likewise, these, these things, thought, belief, desires, allows us to account for the behavior and predict the behavior of other people. Uh, and, and it's done differently in different cultures, but it serves the same. And, and that fits James's theory. Uh, they, and the other thing that fits James's theory is, is they, they behave in lawful ways, disturbingly lawful ways, because um, we, well, I'll, I'll say this first and then tell you why. So thoughts can be deep and rapid. Clearly, they are, the concept of a thought is borrowed from a physicality of depth or something moving. Uh, desires can be strong and weak, again, borrowed from experiences we had. Memories can be distant, just like Jane says. Uh, metaphors borrow from the physical world. Uh, one of the problems that goes along with this is, for instance, we hold people accountable if they aren't consistent in their beliefs. That is, we, we say that you can't believe something and not believe it at the same time. And that's because belief is borrowed from the physicality of, uh, in front of me here, you know, the mouse and the cup can't be in the same place at the same time. So metaphorically, we borrow from the world, the, what James would call the parifiers, they go along and they create a lot of problems because we can believe something and not believe it at the same time. Beliefs, that's why people are so strange is that our, our, our states of being are not objects. They don't obey the same rules, but we have to pretend they do and we, have, and we treat other people as though they should. And I think this causes a lot of problems. That being said, it's wonderful also, poetry and writing and everything, you know, is possible because of this. So I guess everything is a double-edged sword. Um, so it supports James. So the last kind of dramatic point I wanna make before the end is um, the conversation. Uh, so I also say how this stuff arises arose in ancient times uh, and everybody talks about words and and sequencing of words and the big argument is well how old are words and how old is the ability to put two words together and how old is the ability to form a symbolic relationship uh, and uh, you know people you know friendships are ended by one guy putting it at a million years and another person putting it at 50,000 um, the, probably <clears throat> the ability <clears throat> excuse me to uh, form an abstraction, a word, goes back to Homo erectus, possibly. Uh, that's one of the very earliest hominids to walk upright and walk over most of the world at that time. Um, but they probably had very little cortical control over their vocalization. But then as you move on, um, probably more. My thoughts about this, though, is they never got to the point of a conversation which is where I think the magic happens. And so what this diagram here shows at the bottom <clears throat> is what we've been talking about, the infant basic behavior of basic behavior, pause, behavior, pause, behavior. So initially on the way to adult conversation, you have a stress vowel, a trans syllable, stress vowel, trans syllable, uh, trans syllable and stress vowel. Uh, this can be conventionalized by the group into a repeatable phrase and so you can have phrase, pause, phrase, pause, phrase. This can be conventionalized as a child learns the rules of the game into talk, listen, talk, listen, talk. And then this can further be conventionalized into dialogue, break, dialogue, break. 
And now you have the ability for a conversation. And um, a book I just reviewed called Cognitive Gadgets, you know, uh, this woman, Cecilia Hayes, believes that it is the conversation that actually lifted us out of the Pleistocene into uh, more modern times. And, and I think she's right about it because uh, words aren't enough. Even symbolic words aren't enough. It's the ability to sustain a conversation with another people in which you get to learn, oh, you were wrong and you correct it or the other person can correct you. That takes time. And, it, and, 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 and then here's the next thing that it takes, which is um, very strange. It's a paradoxical and James nailed it a long time ago. And here's what he said about the conversation. In a certain sense, we have to become the other person or rather we let him become part of us for a brief second. We suspend our own identities after which we come back to ourselves. We accept or reject what he said. To hear, James pointed out, and he's correct, just to hear is a kind of obedience. It is very strange for a mammal to stop and hold still while another mammal controls it. And that is for me to freeze while another person starts a sentence. Um, so that's pretty rare. And from the brain's point of view, nothing, you know, it's trapped in a bony skull. It's wondering, what is this guy doing? You know, he's turning over control to who? A perfect stranger until the stranger finally hits the last word in the sentence. Um, so sentences are very much like jokes. They're exactly the same thing. The only difference between a sentence and a joke is the initial word of the joke is an extreme unexpected thing and you're put into a high state of tension. And then, and then and the, the, you, it builds and builds and builds with the joke. Finally, the punchline has come and you're so relieved that you do this hiccupy thing, you laugh. Uh, but a sentence is basically the same thing except the start off is just normal, the quick brown fox. Okay, jumped over the lazy dog's back, no big deal. But people do wait for you to get through it. And finally, the last word has disambiguated the whole thing. But it is strange. And even I was talking about before, predictive coding is the way to approach this. You do turn yourself over to the other person. Believe it or not, a conversation, maybe, maybe you know it already, is a very special form of intimacy uh, that, that the animal world doesn't have available to it. So that's Jane's control of obedience. I think the poor guy knew so much, I, I feel sorry for him. <laughs> um, so uh, coming up on the end, the phenomenology of consciousness, this is you know what he says. Uh, there's an analog eye and metaphor me. Um, we can talk about what that is. The fundamental world it lives in though is a metaphorical uh, space time. Uh, and near transition is the vehicle. And this little seven-year-old now realizes he's guilty. Fortunately, he can go to confession and get over it and sin again. Um, so there's one thing though interesting, exception is more powerful than you might think. Um, where is the, uh, James did ask the question, you know, hey, are we conscious all day? Um, you know, every hour, every second, every minute, every nanosecond. And we're not. Uh, and he, and one of the reasons, so he, he says in different places about words. He talks about how words get our attention onto something and words hold our attention onto something and words help us remember that something and words help us to share attention on that something with other people. And then words help us to even understand relationships. Uh, I think James thought that this was the means by which we are able to just remember one sensory experience. And I've always thought this weird because all of us right now are, are very high dimensional beings. All of our senses are working. Why aren't we aware of a near infinitude of experiences? Uh, what is the mechanism that picks one out from that? Now, I've looked for it in neuroscience. There is something that might be able to, to do it, but I have a feeling James was right, that the way words allow us to um, sort of in an embossed way 
pluck out one sensory experience from all the multitudes that we're now experiencing uh, is kind of a, a, a key feature of consciousness because that's what we remember. If you ask somebody, you know, how what what did you see at Starbucks? And they'll well, I saw John. Well, they did a lot else too. So anyway, Jay's tried to capture this with a wonderful uh, example of uh, asking a flashlight in a dark room to look around for some place where there is no light. And so the flashlight uh, would get back to you and say, nope, every place I looked, the room was well lit. It's a well lit room. Uh, and of course it wasn't. So, uh, so it is with consciousness there. It's a much smaller part of our mental life and flashlight goes out there. And that's where I'll give you guys a break. Check out and thank you for your conscious attention. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill. That was, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. Uh, could you hit the red button and stop sharing the screen? Here we go. Red button. Wonderful. So folks, I'm going to start by, uh, you know, there's just so many interesting things uh, here. I'm going to give you guys a chance to now ask questions. We're going to start with uh, Roland. Uh, folks, if you, so we have got uh, the following rules. Um, go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, try to keep your questions brief uh, so that we can have as many questions and give a chance for Bill to fully explicate um, everything that he's been talking about. Uh, so it's going to be Roland followed by Joe. Roland, go ahead. Uh, Roland, you need to unmute yourself. Hi, all. Hi, Bill. There you go. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. And it's always uh, there are more questions than there are answers, I think. Yeah. So my question is, do you think that the ability to visualize or realize the realities of other people uh, is increasing with time? Yeah, people used to ask Julian Jeans, where's all this going? Um, you know, is it getting more? Is it getting less? Um, it's probably just getting different. Um, you know, to make sure, how, how did you ask the question again? Is, 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 say your question again to make sure I'm going to answer the right thing. So, uh, you taught us that uh, children, even uh, from nine months on, can imagine the world of uh, adults, of other people and objects. Yes. And um, I'm wondering if I'm now uh, as capable, capable as that nine months uh, child. Yeah, for sure you are. Uh, in fact, you know, there are folk sayings or uh, we all carry around everybody we've met. You can't undo that. Uh, we are we're social beings. Uh, I think in the Hopi language, the, it, it says every experience you have makes you a different person. And it, neurologically, it actually does. So uh, I would think you're carrying around everybody you've met to a different degree. Um, and so the answer is yes, that, that you, um, well, I don't know. If that answers your question. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, next up is going to be Joe. Joe, go ahead. So um, one of your slides, you said, James, and said that guilt is conscious shame. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could expand upon that a little bit, uh, just because uh, at what age does the, is someone able to make a distinction between those two? Because I look at guilt as an action and shame is something that is the essence of the action so it's I, what so could you just expand upon that a mm -hmm. little bit? i think that's clear if you read james i think he when he said shame he said what people talk about for animal behavior dogs well all social animals when they do something that violates the group norms you see the head goes down the tail goes between the legs 
Um, now, all mammals that are social have, and we do too. We have shame behavior. We lower our head. We will lower our eyes. We will act humble. That is immediate. That, that comes from older parts of the brain. It's a very good response. It, it, it enables the group, and this is pre-conscious, the group to know you know you weren't quite right. So now, you, after age seven, when we become a narratizer, you have the option of telling yourself a story about that shame event. And in fact, there's nothing to keep you from constantly telling yourself that story. Um, and that's, so that's guilt. You, you, carry it, you carry guilt with you, but you can't carry guilt with you until you can tell a story about yourself. And among the many, many stories you can tell is the story of what I did yesterday when I broke that cup uh, and people looked at me. Uh, normally that would go away when uh, you buy a new cup and everybody says, okay, you're great. But no, we keep saying day after day, why did I do that? You know, and, and so that's, con so Jane says that consciousized shame is guilt. Uh, let me follow up on uh, Roland's question. So mm -hmm. children develop a sense of that the other person has this conscious interiority going, going on. So Roland's question was that, how does it develop over there? So let me rephrase it another way. So as a person grows, mm -hmm. how does the sense of what is going on in the other person, how does that grow? So for example, it, 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 I, I'm guessing that as a child, you know, in case of a child, it is going to be relatively primitive, uh, but somebody further out, like an adult would have a much more complex idea of what may be going on within another person's head. What, uh, what are your thoughts about what, what happens to this notion of what is going on in other person's head over time? Well, well of course, once you're conscious, you can um, begin going beyond what the infant, because you can invent fictions about mm -hmm. the other people, mm -hmm. other persons. Now, sometimes those fictions can be correct. Mm -hmm. and, and we say, I'm really, I understand her now, finally. Uh, you could be wrong, but nevertheless, the person who's older is now in control of their attempt to understand the other person with uh, narratives. Now, we never lose that affect attunement part, though, for instance, uh, you, know, you often see people who are having an argument and, uh, and one will say, well, I heard, yeah, I know what you said. It's how you said it. And the other person will say, what are you talking about? How I said it. And, and so we're always, we always are, it's con conflicting because we always know things about each other that really nobody wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. And so we're always growing throughout life though. Mm -hmm. You can't stop the learning. And, and so the, the older, and the idea though, you want a culture which nurtures that. And, and you know, some cultures are extremely communal so communal that they don't kill people who do bad, they ostracize them. And for a Westerner, that's, oh, great, let me, great, I'm, I'm on my way out. But no, it can be a death sentence. And that's because it, their, their sense of self, oh, uh, as they grow, as you know, af, after year two, three, and four, is just constantly intensified in terms of the other. Uh, Native Americans are actually, it's not something they're just playing with. They conceive of themselves as a totem. They are part of nature. And some cultures, they, you can't separate, it sounds odd, you separate yourself from another person. That, and that works really well for those cultures. Westerners, we starting around 500 B or so, so have in this individualism where we teach ourselves, you're on your own, do it yourself. And we separate ourselves from each other. There's a huge continuum. Uh, I probably didn't answer your question because I said it's so big. No, no, it's uh, it's it's a great answer because it actually filled out a lot more gaps. You you answered a lot more than I, I asked. Uh, so next up is going to be Laura, Mike, and Brian. Laura, what's your question? Uh, Laura, you need to unmute yourself. 
Okay, just a quick anecdote. I was, I had a puppy and we would go into this store often. And one day we were going in and she stopped in the doorway and didn't move for a while. And then she moved a little bit and she started barking furiously because she was looking in the mirror and she saw another dog, which actually was her. And she went crazy. And that was that moment, you know, when she saw herself. So I thought I saw that. Thank you. So anyway, that was it. <laughs> James talks about the mirror self-recognition test. I don't know if you've heard about that. No. Uh, he, uh, there's, there's, at 18 months, human children begin to pass the mirror self-recognition test. That is, they will surreptitiously put a dot on the child's forehead when they don't know it and then give them a mirror and see at what age, when they look in the mirror, they will touch the dot. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh-oh, did, did, did Laura get muted? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, it, th that's, that's the normal procedure we have. We have oh, okay. people ask questions you. and then you get to respond to it. And there is a whole bunch of people waiting in line to ask next questions. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, uh, you, you're done, okay. Uh, next up is uh, Mike, followed by Brian. Mike. I was interested in your physics background, just as physicist Francis Crick discovered DNA because of his new insights. Uh, and Roger, this guy, Roger Penrose, uh, had this, uh, wrote several papers on physics of learning. Um, has your knowledge of physics given you some of the insights uh, you shared with us? Uh, uh, or are you familiar with any of his papers? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't say the physics itself brought too much to the table. Um, but then again, um, I, it, may, it may sound straight. So I... I started life, I, well, I started young life as an artist. I was supposed to be an artist and I walked away from that. I became a saxophone player, professional saxophone player. And, uh, and then I became a singer and songwriter in LA. Um, and then I, I did physics, uh, I write songs all, and, and, and I've worked for 20 years in neuroscience, make, making custom brain implants in my house. The thing is, I, when I talk to people about this, I just don't see a lot of difference between these things. I, uh, I sort of do what's in front of me. And it really doesn't feel that, physics doesn't feel that much different from anything else. It's just something to do. Um, so I, I, I don't remember bringing anything to the table uh, other than being a human being when I began studying consciousness. It's probably a disappointing answer, but I, I really, haven't brought any physics to the table. Uh, thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Brian. Uh, your one slide uh, reminded me immediately of a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre, and I wanted to see how it, how you would react to it. The um, it's the slide where the first of all the adult and the child are looking at a, the same object, and then all of a sudden, the way you presented it, the adult is looking at the child and the child is looking at the adult, looking at the child. It's the line right. going back and forth between them. Uh, Sartre said that uh, the most important experience in anyone's life is being seen. And the, uh, he has a story that goes by, behind it. Uh, Andre Gide, a French author, was once uh, rummaging through the his mother's drawers in her mother's bedroom the mother walked in and exclaimed and he wasn't really trying to steal anything but exclaimed you're a thief and andre g became a uh, a kleptomaniac in later life <laughs> so in any event your comments on that yeah i think he's correct um uh, it and all I added was the mechanism. I wanted to know what preceded what you know in infancy that made being seen possible. 
And it was so it was all that stuff, the rhythmic entrainment and stuff. It, there has to be an explanation there, you know. And uh, so that's what I was mainly interested in. But um, by knowing that you're being seen, what I think the utility of that is, is it's the uh, first step toward knowing that other people have a different point of view, including you. They're looking at you. So you, you have a sense. Of, that's the first time that you have a sense of yourself from a third person point of view. From, can take yourself as an object because you recognize somebody else. It's kind of a virtual mirror. So I agree with Sartre. Uh, I think he nailed it even without being a child developmental psychologist. Wonderful. Uh, Dave, what's your question? Yeah, uh, it was my understanding when the infant is very young, he thinks the mother is part of himself. Is that something you understand as well? That the, there's this continuation between my body and her body. There's probably is something to that in that um, in the very first year of life, the first few months for sure, the infant is busy forming predictions about its own movements uh, and, and then moving and confirming them. Um, at that point, it doesn't really know the difference between itself and other th yeah. world. Uh, that takes a while. And finally, th toward the end of uh, the first year, uh, it begins to realize, oh, you know, certain things I do, uh, I can do them repeatedly and get the same result. I probably am not the same thing as the world. But for a long time, well, for maybe a month or so, I would say the infant can't tell much of the difference. Wonderful. So folks, I have several questions uh, for, uh, for Bill. Uh, you can continue typing uh, exclamation mark and we will we'll go get to all your questions. So Bill, this is just incredible. Okay, I have, I have so many interesting, uh, interesting thoughts here. Uh -huh. First, let's look at music. You know, you're a musician uh -huh. and look at like a jazz band playing mm -hmm. and what is going on between, between people to create great music. Um, so th that's one kind of one point. Second point I want to make is that this is actually a very revolutionary idea in Western thinking. As you pointed out that since 500 BC, we've been saying that an individual does everything. And then as an afterthought, we interact with people. Yeah. Here, what James is saying is that that socialness, that social interaction actually comes in in just development of consciousness itself yeah. that's yeah. a very radical way of looking at it of role of others in our existence yeah you can't actually become an individual unless you're socialized to be an individual it's almost paradoxical yes so even though you have these strong individuals in western society and they think they think on their own and they're doing it no they had to be they had to go through this intense socialization, but they were socialized to think of themselves though. And it was because of the way the Greek, Greek empire was evolving and the way Roman empire, it was very utilitarian, uh, especially as urban centers rose. It was very utilitarian to raise children to be somewhat independent of the group. It's kind of sad in a way though, because uh, initially though, we're very one with mother and our caregivers. Um, and there's a loneliness. I mean, why, why are there so many clinicians, psychologists, therapists? I mean, the list is long. Mm -hmm. And it's all because we can talk to Brian about it, but it, it's all because of the way we uh, teach consciousness in the West. Uh, I, I think the psychotherapy stuff is mostly a Western pathology. So let's look at two other things. So one is about music and second is about conversation. Uh -huh. um, because you, I can very clearly see this in music as well. You know, oh, if yeah. you want to be a good musician, you actually have to play with others and you kind of work and the complexity of what you can do. You're kind of, you're using this uh, both or all these levels, you know, it's a dance, mm -hmm. it also yeah. affect 
attunement, right? You're, you're, somebody is giving you something and you're not giving exactly the same thing back. You're right. using a different instrument, you're doing a different variation, but you're kind of speaking back. So yeah. can you talk a little bit about music and these ideas? Yeah, sure. For years, I stood as a saxophone player on stage with a, a bass amplifier taller than me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you feel that bass. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you, you can hear the drummer. Uh, out of the corner of your eye, you, you see the guitar player and, and the vocalist. Um, at, at the quarter second level, you're forming predictions about what they are going to do. You also know that they're forming predictions about what you're going to do. You, you form a mini community at this moment. And uh, like dancing, uh, you create, well, in dancing, you create a virtual third person. The behavior of the two people cannot be predicted on the basis of any one alone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so that, that happens in music, except it's more than just two people. But it, it is all based on, you, you, first you create a safe zone so that as you move toward a violation of where the band was, the other guys think it's okay. They're gonna go with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they don't consider it a violation. They play off of it and you sense that and that feels good. And then somebody else kind of takes the lead. You know, for jazz, it's all improvisation, which in a sense is dangerous. You know, you're outside the rules, but we're, I think you called attention to the right thing, uh, dancing and playing music together. But even conversation is similar to just watch two people having a conversation. It's also very creative. They, you'll see people crossing their arms at the same time, they're leaning forward at the same time. But much more is going on in the attunements. You know, you can attune with, you can send that other person message or you breach their core, as I said. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it, it is, it's an astonishing thing. I, well, the, I, I looked for it in animals, it's not there. And you know, something, um, I don't know, maybe it was you said, uh, it may be old to this obstetrical dilemma that we are born premature and I think we're the only animal, the only primate that is born with such a need for intimacy that has to be held. And that alone surpri- supplies the likelihood of these rhythmic entrainments going on. Animals who are born, you know, we have two days ago, we had a, a sheep born, really mm-hmm. cute. Mm-hmm. In no time at all, it was up and walking. It mm-hmm. wasn't dependent on the mother for closeness and everything so the for the human infant the mother's body is a terrain literally a terrain other animals you know they're they're born it can be sand on a beach or it can be rocky cliffs they learn the terrain they internalize that terrain Mm -hmm. we internalize the terrain of another living body really closely really intimately And, and 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 that means conversation dance play music together. It's all the same species. Um, and uh, yeah. Wow. So uh, the third, third point I want to bring up is conversation. Uh, you said to hear is to obey. Yeah. Where I just let's, let's, you know, just elaborate a little bit on that because that's very profound because you're letting the mm-hmm. other person through right. words, a place in your consciousness you're actually having like a simulation of what it would be like in your head and then using that and then making a second step. And not only that, then you are actually throwing back the words at them and they are doing yeah, the same they, thing and it comes back. So please talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, and in the language of the predictive coding, which is the current science of studying uh, living things as being in a predictive state. The, so the, in this view, the brain really is, it's not an exaggeration, an organ of perception. The brain lives in the future because it has to make sure you stay alive the next quarter second. That's a big job. Uh, when I say big, I mean, it, like right now, my brain is deciding whether I push the cell phone out of the way or I lean over here or, or get up and close the door because of the cat. The brain is considering these options. It has to also consider how many calories do I assign? So the last few tens of milliseconds, it decides on calories. 
-hmm. That means from the brain point of view, even little things are life and death. It, it takes, it's amazing. Uh, our brain is so confused by us, you know, what are we doing? But for the, con and then for the conversation, you know, the brain really wants to be in control of the next uh, quarter second, but we don't, we hold still. So polite, we let that person, the quick brown fox jumped over. We're still listening, the lazy dog. Um, you, so it is a very odd thing to give control over to another person. Um, but it is rewarding in, in the sense that we have an expectation of where they're gonna go. When that's verified, the brain, it, it, it is happy. It's sort of like one example I use in infancy, you know, infants love to have a string on their toe tied to a, a, a mobile that makes a sound. And, and they love to move their toe and get a sound. Well, they would do that forever. It's the same thing. They, the brain predicts what should happen. It does happen. There's a shot of oxytocin, or I forget how to say it. And uh, uh, it, it feels good to predict and verify, predict and verify, predict and verify. And so that's why conversations feel good. Uh, even when, because the, you create a safe zone. So even when you're wrong in a conversation, Oh, like the jazz musician, they veer off from it, but it's a safe zone. We're allowed to do this. Mm -hmm. And you get to get to places you would never have gotten before. You can try things out and you're not ostracized because all this happens at the sub-second level or a couple second level. Let's look at a time a little bit uh, after this, writing. Because writing, again, if listening is to obey, yeah. reading a sentence is to obey too but in a very interesting way, because it gives you some distance. You're not in presence of the person. It allows you a little bit of distance. So that's one thing. The second is what does the writing do to yourself? Because you are actually writing and then you are reading back and you are able to reflect on, on your own thoughts. Of, of a moment ago to evaluate them, to, to kind of do kind of awareness of your, your thoughts. So any, any thoughts about how writing is related to, to conversation and the socialness of human beings and what role it plays in uh, individual thinking? Well, I think writing is an extension of the conversation, just like crib, crib talk, the infant, you hear, uh, sometime in the teen months, the second year, they talk to themselves in the crib. Yes. Now, they couldn't do that if they hadn't internalized another person, because they're actually talking to an imaginary other person. That's the, and so, and then you teach someone to write the same thing. You have a skill in which you're really talking to another person, because first you had to learn to address another person. What does it mean to address it? You have to, you know, they say, what's the secret to writing? Well, just sit down and start. It doesn't matter what you say, uh -huh. start. Start talking to the other person. But I do think writing is just, a, is a version of that. Uh, uh, of, it's just, another, again, a really safe zone because you can do it in the privacy of yourself. But you often hear young people say when they've written their first essay in high school or college, they say, you know, I didn't know what I thought until I wrote that. Uh, so it gives you the opportunity to, to like with another living person to try something out and be surprised at it, but it's safe enough that you can recover. So like the infant can recover, the good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, it's a safe zone to recover uh, and try it again, which is the secret to writing besides starting is rewriting. Wonderful. Because you're, uh, that's what I think about that. Excellent. So, Brian, what, what do you think of the presentation? Uh, any comments, any thoughts? Uh, Brian, you're on mute. Yeah, so um, a, a lot of thoughts, but one thing in particular that stood out to me um, that was discussed, this idea of uh, to hear is a kind of obedience. And the reason why that deeply resonated with me is because when I was training to be a counselor, there was a lot of attention given 
to what they called active listening and how to be mindful when someone else is speaking. And the idea is that you're supposed to be open, uh, empathic, sympathetic. And in a way you're supposed to suspend your own thoughts at that time when the client or patient is, um, when, when they're speaking. And that's really the only way to uh, put yourself in their shoes as it were, and to understand uh, what they're saying. So in any, cause I, I just wanna emphasize that. And I think of course that applies to counseling, but it applies to daily life in general. You know, this idea of, you know, perhaps we should be thinking along those terms more often in order to facilitate better communication between people um, to view hearing or listening to another person as a type of obedience, at least a temporary type of obedience. Um, that's just a, a comment. And then one other thing I, I just wanna mention, and this is sort of a comment slash question, I suppose. It's just a vague thought that I have that's been haunting me. This idea when humans speak, the idea is that there's the self and then there's the other, and I speak to the other. But it also seems to me something else is going on. When we speak to another person, at the same time, we're also speaking back to ourselves. There's a sort of loop going on. And I don't know if that means anything. I'm not sure what, if there are any uh, neuropsychological implications, but it just seems, as I said, it haunts me that th that must be uh, a, a piece of some puzzle when it comes to communication, when it comes to uh, how do we, how do we get engaged in, in these, these complex loops of communication? In any case, like I said, that's, a, I'm not sure if there's even a, an answer to that or a comment you could give, but I'm just fascinated by this idea of how all communication is projected to another, but it's also projected back to ourselves because we hear ourselves speak. There's no way that you can speak without um, listening to yourself, as it were. So in any case, um, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Well, for sure, to learn language, for instance, there are several layers in which you listen to yourself. Um, you, and you, in humans, when they're you know, learning to imitate speech, they have to learn to correct very quickly. They hear themselves very quickly if they've said the word wrong, and we correct it. And so uh, there's some researchers, Hickok and Popple, who study language learning. Um, and um, what's their talking brain is sort of their ongoing dialogue that people can join in. Uh, but, but they show that the, the ability to know what you're saying uh, and correct for it has, starts very low even at the, the proprioception of the tongue and the jaw and the lips. They, when, you're, when you're saying the quick brown fox, you had a prediction about what your vocal tract should feel like, which is invisible to us. We don't kind of think about proprioception. But then we also have the immediate feedback we hear, and then just through the bones. Uh, and then we have the external feedback. It comes out into the air and goes back in. Uh, so the, it's kind of an awkward answer to your question, but it, there's several layers uh, in which you are, your brain in a way, is very aware of the temporal sequence in terms of feedback. How am I doing? And you are judging yourself on that. The, the, you can see it when people learn, obviously, because they correct quickly. Um, and you know, you say the Lord is a shoving leopard. Uh, clearly, that was a mistake. Uh, instead of the Lord is a shoving leopard, um, the, a, a lot of sentences are loaded up to use a computer for way ahead of time, and and that's why you could say that. But uh, I think that it kind of disappears. But we 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 have to be judging ourselves at all those levels: the the proprioceptive level, the the internal hearing the external when it comes around the ear, and then you can't turn off your constant estimate of is the other person getting it? So it probably doesn't simplify your, your, your question, but uh, in my studies of, of speech acquisition, uh, self-judgment happens at a constant level, at, uh, I mean, a constant, constantly going at, at many levels. Uh, so let me just broaden, uh, sorry, uh, Brian, you were saying something? 
Um, I, actually, yeah, j just if I may, just a very quick. Uh, Please, uh, take your uh, time. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, Bill, for that. That the uh, that um, you know that, that that's what I suspected, and and I just want to add again within the context of counseling. You know, you said that there's different levels of feedback, different levels of judgment, and you know this is something that I tell my clients that when they're having a interpersonal problem with someone and they want to learn how better to communicate, you know, I tell them, of course, you have to speak to the other person, but remember, you're also speaking to yourself. And so whatever you're saying, judge yourself, not to beat up on yourself, not, not, not to judge yourself in a, in a uh, overly judgmental way. But the idea is to take in that information, because not only do you, do we have to learn new roles to deal with difficult people, but we also have to learn from our own words. And so there's a, a, a sort of a, a, a self-learning process going on, uh, I, I think, at one level, anytime that we, we speak to another person. As I said, we're also speaking to ourselves. And it's as simple as it sounds, we are hearing ourselves. We are reminding ourselves mm -hmm. of things that we should be doing. And you know, it, it, I think that's culturally dependent, too. Um, we were sort of taught that, hey, the other guy just has to take it. I, I'm, I ha, it's my responsibility to tell him what, you know, what to do. Uh, and but basically, we're correcting in Western world other people's thoughts. Um, uh, whereas some cultures, you know, anthropologists go to some cultures and they start talking about the mind, and they say, what are you talking about? You can't know what's going on in another person's mind, let alone tell them anything about what to do. I think we have a I think I think we have more psychopathologies than than traditional cultures just because of what you were saying that we're taught not to pay attention to our to judging ourselves. Mm -hmm. That the real job is to make everybody get back up and get out there in the game. In the western uh, view I, I I'm I'm stunned sometimes you go to the bookstore and the size of the self-help section it just doesn't <laughs> it makes sense. So I want to uh, follow up on this one notion of these feedback loops, mm -hmm. because I found it to be just fundamental to human growth, because what you're seeing there, you, you look at that, look at the kid. First, firstly, it is an amazing video and a heartrending video because you can Isn't see yeah. the... <laughs> I'm so happy part. when she says it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's like you can see progressively the the panic yeah. go up because it's like it's a lifeline which has gone away. And it is a catastrophe for her, for, for, for the child. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah. uh, it was amazing. Uh, but to see how much how much we depend on this loop, it's not mm -hmm. that we figure something out and then we say we are in a continuous loop by of talking, getting feedback from others, getting feedback from ourselves, you, her, hearing yourself talk, mm -hmm. explicating your thoughts, and then getting feedback from others. The, uh, the corrective mechanism, because it is hard to figure out the world. The world is very complex. There's mm -hmm. a lot as human beings, as individuals, as society, we have, enormously complex and you need that corrective feedback mechanism of others to provide a balance to all kinds of biases that we have confirmation biases and things like that so uh, i i regard this feedback feedback mechanism to be a crucial part of the human experience in a way where i don't think most people actually get it what, what do you yeah, think about right. they, they don't it's um especially westerners though because they they we really do have the impression that we're on our own mm -hmm. and and that is uh, socially psychologically neurophysiologically not true uh you can't be an individual without being socialized to be an individual uh and so i i, I think that's true um you made me think of um the, the current trends in anthropology, uh, I don't know if that, mm -hmm. uh, the weirdest people in the world, have you, mm -hmm. have you heard of this book? Uh, no, I have not. So uh, Joseph Henrich and others too, 
even the book I reviewed, uh, Cognitive Gadgets, mm -hmm. um, is going that what got us through the late Pleistocene, but mm -hmm. not Neanderthal or Homo heidelbergensis and all those others, was just what you said. That, uh, it, well, it was the conversation. The ability to stop and pause and learn and listen and learn together. And it, it sounds like a lot of feel good talk. It's not. It, you, you, it, in, if uh, some of these people, the anthropologists, I think the, the one I'm thinking of, his name is Boyd. Uh, he, I saw him give a talk to a group of economists who were eating dinner and they were kind of bored. Uh, and, but he opened up with, he said, you're all really smart and you are, and they had PhDs and everything. So he said, I could take any one of you or all of you and put you up into Alaska on the tundra and you would be dead within a day. And, and so his point with all that, he goes on, is that from the current view in anthropology that, that these Henrich and others are, uh, it's pretty clear. We, the, the trend is called self-domestication that from, uh, Roughly, uh, our last common ancestor with the chimpanzee, uh, we are on an increasing path of self-domestication, which means lower sexual dimorphism, smaller difference between male and females, less aggressive male faces, less competition between males, a whole bunch of other things like this for two several million years, which basically made us more cooperative. And, and then you hit that obstetric dilemma, the infant. Um, the, the whole thing that makes us special is we can take the other person into account. And that's how you learn because even in science, everybody is wrong at the beginning. Everybody's theory is wrong. You, you, uh, you just yep. can't do it. Uh, and you depend, science really depends on other people. I, I was in high energy physics. I built what they say are the most complicated instruments in the world. So I was in a lab. It was the most social experience I've ever had, more so than music. And I watched people make amazing things and, and invent things, electronics and, and, and these detectors. Well, I also watched them talk to each other. I, I kind of made notes. And they learned these things from each other under the illusion that they had and other people too praise, oh, wow, this guy's really smart. You know what he came up with yesterday? Well, I watched him talk to another guy who, and, and he said this. So I think you're totally right. We're social creatures. Um, um, we, we depend upon others. We can't help but make mistakes. And the only way to correct those is to understand other people have a different point of view and to accept it. Uh, uh, that may have veered too far from your question. No, that's that's fantastic. Uh, so now this is for both uh, you and Brian. Uh, one of the thinkers that I have found really useful on this point is Carl Rogers and his idea of authentic relating, of that if you actually listen to the other person, um, try to see, try to understand what they are saying and the other person is doing the same thing for you, regardless of whether it is in a therapeutic kind of environment or just friends or just a regular conversation, that is profoundly good for both parties because it allows you to, um, so that, that is a basic observation that authentic relating with uh, that. So any, any thoughts about that and how it relates to what we are talking about, about con value of conversation. Is that for Brian? Uh, for both of you. Let's see what Brian thinks. Brian. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned Carl Rogers and of course he's uh, for many people fundamental to uh, counseling and th there's a whole tradition of Ro Rogerian uh, therapy. And uh, I mean, what you said about him, of course, is right. This whole idea of authenticity and listening uh, uh, you, know, you know we all do it all the time but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's genuine authentic listening and that's why uh, people use the term active listening a sort of mindful listening and uh, the only thing I, I, I could add to, to what you said is this idea 
of uh, healing and just the presence in, uh, with another person can be healing. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have, it doesn't mean that they have a mental disorder. It could just mean they're upset that day. It could be with a friend or a family member. And uh, to, 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 to just listen to them and, and just presence itself, actually, I, I believe uh, is a type of healing. It, 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 it triggers something in the brain, probably, and I don't know what it is, that, um, that leads to a, a, a type of self-soothing. So this is where uh, listening comes in. And, you know, related to this is, I think there's a problem I've noticed with people where someone is talking about their problem going on and on, and the other person assumes that their role is to fix that problem. And one, one thing I learned in counseling is that many times people don't expect you to fix their problem. They just expect you to listen to whatever they're saying. And just unloading can be a therapeutic uh, uh, a process, a, th a therapeutic, uh, it can have a therapeutic benefit. So again, it all comes down to listening. And actually, j just to go off uh, track a little bit here, because this relates to James, in his book, he briefly discusses what we might call uh, the, the pre-bicameral -bi step in communication. And he postulates this idea that before people heard the voices of gods, they actually heard their own voice. So we're talking pre-Neolithic, we're going back, um, you know, before civilization. And of course, that's very difficult to, to prove now, if, if that was the case. But I think it's very interesting, um, at least that, that, that spec theoretical speculation, that before we heard the voices of our ancestors or our gods among bicameral people, we actually would tell ourselves what to do. We weren't conscious of what the voice, you know, we weren't, we were not conscious yet, but somewhere in our psyche, our own voice was registered. Our, for, so for example, people had to be told to stay on the same task in order to sharpen a rock or to fix a fishing net, whatever it was. And the only way to do that uh, before people be heard by camera voices from the gods was to have a repetitive voice in their head. So you can see there's some sort of trajectory, mm -hmm. um, I, I think. I, I, I think we really are just scratching the surface when it comes to this whole idea of loops and self-communication and listening to other people. I, th I think there's a, that, that should be a field in itself, actually. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we were talking uh, this morning about different cultures, you know, your exposure to different cultures as broadening so in some sense, you know, when you're taking in another culture, actually listening to another culture, you are opening up many possibilities, which you actually have not even thought of yourself. And you're kind of losing all of that when you're just focused on the current upbringing that you have had. Uh, if you don't actually authentically look at another culture and say, okay, what are the human possibilities? And following up with something that uh, Bill said, Bill, um, I mean, one thing I've noticed that compared to America, the old world, older civilizations mm -hmm. deal with social interaction in a very different way. Oh, so yeah. family is very close and very big fam family and friends. You have this entire circle of people around you mm -hmm. and you function within it. They are kind of part of how you operate. That is very different. Uh, and that has been the case, you know, if you go further back in time, like if you look at the tribes, et cetera, that's far more true mm -hmm. in, in a smaller tribe than even kind of old world cultures now. But um, so in that sense, it's very unusual of having this kind of the focus that you're talking about on individual, regardless of this society, or kind of looking at it as individual versus society. What 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 do you think? So one thing you said the, the that's this guy talks a lot mm -hmm. about um, the change in as the Roman Empire expanded north, 
in traditional cultures. They basically eliminated tribal marry, interperson, uh, cousin marriages. But, and one thing that he concentrates on are these tests in which people in, taken into a lab are allowed the option of lying or cheating. And what he's found out that in cultures which are closer together, the family is everything, it's okay to lie and cheat if, if it's your brother-in-law and stuff. Whereas Westerners, who's nobody is anybody's friend, they, they say, no, you don't ever lie and cheat. It's kind of strange. Um, but, but, but anyway, you'll see, if you, if you be, look at all in the weirdest person, you'll see all these tests, which he, he's trying to find out uh, how far will people go when they're tribal to help each other. And they go very far, just like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing what Brian was talking about is, um, I, I think it's absolutely true. If somebody needs help, the last thing you want to do is tell them what they need to do. Uh, that just introduces another category. And, and, you know, and, and if they're listening to you, they know you could be wrong. Because categories have sharp edges. And as living creatures, we don't have sharp edges. We're analog. And so, as I think as Brian intimated, the best thing to do for anybody if they need help is give them something to do. But don't make them, don't let them know you're helping them. Uh, and even what you just said, learn about another culture. That, that means they're just doing something and nobody's telling them they're being fixed. Um, so, uh, so I think uh, I think most of our problems are the lexicalization of themselves. You know, what, you know, yeah, I'm Irish. Well, wait a minute, how much do I have to think about this? I'm a really Irish or, oh my gosh, I'm upset. I'm not really Irish, all this. Um, just go around that as I see it. It's, it's the best thing. Don't give them more categories you know, because if you say what to do to help them, they got to make a judgment about that. Uh, they're judging you. The best thing to do, as far as I can tell, is don't give them more categories. Give them something to do. We can see if Brian thinks that's okay. So, um, so uh, oh, Brian, you want to, want to comment or can I go ahead? Okay. So there is one, one last thing I want to bring up. Uh, we had a very interesting presentation by an artist. She's a dancer. And what she was, her point was that it's not individual versus others. Mm -hmm. It is individual and others. What happens is that if you are afraid, it, it, she had this very beautiful thing, where it's like, if you're afraid, you're going like this. So that mm -hmm. means you are actually afraid of looking at yourself, kind of reflecting on yourself. And you're afraid of other people. You are kind of, you're saying, but if you have kind of, she used the word love that if you love yourself and love others you're kind of expanding so you're expanding in terms of you're actually more interactive with other people actually connecting with other people more and you're becoming a more of an individual at the same time so you're either becoming more social and more individual or you're becoming less social and less individual less individual in terms of what you can do as an individual. You are, so I thought that was a brilliant point. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I think she's right that, um, you know, to do what she said, <clears throat> I, I've danced also, uh, but mainly I've been a musician. Um, you do have to give yourself over <clears throat> to the other person, to the other people. And that requires trust. And, and oddly, it's the kind of trust that you know the zen of the arrow that is not aimed mm -hmm. so if you I, <clears throat> I do sports too you really want to be in that zone where you're not thinking about it. if you think about this you're not going to do it so you cur you trust yourself and also as a musician uh you have to trust yourself that this passage is coming up you're going to do it yep. and with and with dance too you the, I call it trust. Like she said, you have to learn to trust these other people. And then you move with them. You do that, though, you will discover new things about yourself. And that's why you become simultaneously more individual. Uh, you're in a trusting world, but you still have to learn to trust. Just yes. like you still have to learn the arrow that is not aimed. Frisbee is the same thing. I play ultimate Frisbee. You throw this thing. Um, the more you think about aiming, 
<laughs> and tell you, the worse you're going to get. So I think the more you think about dancing with the other people, uh, but still the art of doing it though, is learning to trust those people. Yes. And then it just happens because learning, Jane said over and over again in the opening chapter, when do you know when one is heavier than the other? You don't know. You can never find that. And, and so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, Bill, this was great. And I think we have just begun to explore this topic. There are, there are lots of lots and things that Julian Jaynes has produced. And I would love to explore more with you uh, on what, you know, what, what we can learn from Julian Jaynes. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, have, have a nice uh, rest of the day. Yeah. See you Thanks folks. Everybody for listening. Okay. Bye, thank everybody. You. Bye.